Hey everyone, how's it going? Uh, really happy to be here. My name is Alan Newkirk. Uh, before I get started, I wanted to uh, answer uh, the questions that I asked all of you myself. I am very familiar with API development. I'm very familiar with uh, documenting APIs. I've done it in many, many projects. And the physical place where I find inspiration is a, is a cross between the shower and the park. So uh, I, I look forward to waking up in the morning and getting in the shower because I, I write code in the shower. Um, I, I sort of muse about uh, ideas and, um, uh, and I organize my day, in fact, uh, when I'm in the shower. So it's, it's probably the, you know, in that short list, it's probably the, the, uh, the top uh, place that I find inspiration. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about good versus bad API documentation. I'm going to start my uh, presentation now. Just give me one second. Uh, so welcome to this talk on good versus bad API documentation. Uh, I really, really appreciate the turnout and all of you being here and allowing me to speak. Again, my name is Al Newkirk. I'm a software engineer and architect. I've been doing this job since the late 90s for a very long time. Uh, I specialize in service-oriented architectures, and I enjoy all things API. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, that you hold all your questions till the end of the presentation. I know that was stated, but I wanted to state it again. And I promise that I will get to your questions at the end of the talk. Um, I, I also hope to connect with and learn more about any of you later. So documentation should not just be usable, but it should also be useful. This is the mantra that I like to share with you. I like you to consider this mantra when you're creating and documenting APIs. Uh, this will be the underlying message behind this presentation. And what it means to me is that your API documentation is more than simply technically correct. Um, it's a little more than that. You should strive for it to be a little more than that. Uh, it's also worth noting that this will not be a technical presentation. I'm not going to be talking about the particulars of RFCs or specifications or particular tooling. Um, I will, uh, however, uh, briefly explain APIs for those that are unfamiliar. I'm really grateful for the polling that took place at the start of the presentation because that gave me insight into where everyone is with respect to the topic. Uh, so here we go. What is an API? So an AP, so API is an acronym for Application Programmable Interface. An API is a mechanism for programming or instructing an application, any application. It uh, doesn't have to be web-based, although that's what a lot of people think when they uh, think of the term API. Um, so say, for example, we want to provide an API uh, to our payment processing system. We might want to allow users to configure which payment methods uh, uh, they accept when they submit uh, payments to be processed. Um, and so that's what an API is for and what an API does. Uh, so what is a REST API? REST is also an acronym, which uh, stands for Representational State Transfer. Uh, it's a methodology for communicating with HTTP APIs or web APIs. Um, it's a protocol and a means for uh, sending and receiving messages. A REST API is an HTTP API that communicates using REST principles. Uh, and this is more or less what it looks like, the, the message that REST APIs transmit. Um, so here's the components. I'm going to describe the slide that you're looking at from left to right, top to bottom. Uh, so in the upper left corner, you have the method. In this case, it's the POST method. Uh, and then you have the URI, which is an acronym for Uniform Resource Identifier. So it identifies a particular resource. Uh, and post is the action that you want to take on that resource. Next, you have the host or location. This is the server where the API lives. Following that, you have content type. This describes the message format. You can send messages in a variety of different formats. It's all text-based, but the, the text can have different syntax and semantics. And so 
That's what's referred to by the content type. The content length uh, is the length of characters and the uh, con and the message and the content body is the, is the rest of it. So how do you document a REST API? You start with an API spec, you bundle the spec with special tags, markers, and templates, and then you generate the documentation from the sources. Um, at the very least, you need the API documentation to be technically correct. So you want to start with a specification. I, I, I always suggest generating the bulk of the technical documentation from a single source of truth, which is typically an API specification. Again, I'm not gonna get into the technical bits of creating an API specification or tooling because that's not what this talk is about. But I do wanna talk about why documenting your API. I mean, I know it's gonna be obvious, you know, the, the um, describing the system and its processes and its, and its properties and processes, um, explaining, uh, everything that's necessary for users to be able to use the API. So that's, that's sort of the given. But also there's an opportunity to identify with users and prospects. Um, you, want, you, you want readers to see your API as being a potential solution for the problem that they have. You also want to expose relevant connections and other services or information or processes and you can also use your API documentation to make value propositions. And we're gonna talk about all of those things. But first I wanna talk about what developers hate and reject about bad API documentation. So first uh, they hate documentation that is jargon laden. Um, prospects are evaluating your API to solve some specific, don't, some, some specific domain or some domain specific problem. Uh, they likely initially don't care about the particular domain or the solution. They don't really care about the jargon or the acronyms that you use. Um, avoid the overuse of proprietary language and documentation would be my suggestion. Documentation that is too short. Uh, at the, again, at the very least, you want your documentation to be technically correct. That is sort of a very low bar. Uh, and if that's all that you're providing, you're not giving readers of your documentation a reason to choose you over the competition. Conversely, sorry, uh, documentation that is too long uh, is also a problem. Uh, you, you don't want to, you, you want to get to the point, you want to provide the necessary relevant information for the users because again, they don't necessarily initially care about your domain, the, the domain whose problem you're, you're solving. Uh, so you don't want to overwhelm them with, uh, with text. And obviously documentation that's inaccurate, which we spoke, which we sort of uh, alluded to earlier when we talked about providing technically correct uh, documentation and generating that documentation from specifications. Documentations with no examples. Uh, this is something that can be easily overlooked. Users using your system, they want to ramp up very quickly and examples help them do that. So you should strive to provide examples for all of the different potential use cases of your API. So let's also talk about what developers love and come to expect from good APIs and good API documentation. Documentation is well organized. Uh, you consider the flow of information and uh, are very thoughtful about where you place information. The documentation is complete and accurate. The documentation uses plain language and has a conversational tone. Again, the reader, the prospect, <coughs> excuse me, is, <coughs> sorry, is potentially new to the domain they are coming in at the entry level. And so you wanna to speak to them as someone that you're leading on a journey uh, into the problem space that, that you're conquering. Also, the documentation has examples and guides. Again, I, I spoke to this uh, with regard to what developers don't like. So you definitely wanna provide examples and guides. The difference between 
examples and guides. Examples are um, usually technical usage scenarios, whereas guides are sort of leading the reader through a journey. Um, maybe a maybe identifying with a particular persona or a particular type of prospect and explaining to them how to solve their particular problem uh, using your API uh, or a series of operations. And the documentation has a glossary. Um, after a prospect becomes a user of your API, the glossary becomes valuable when they need to learn more about the domain. So again, they won't initially care about your particular domain, um, but as they uh, invest more in using your API and become tied to your, tethered to your solution, they'll want to learn more about the problem space. And this is where a glossary comes, comes into play. You, you may, uh, you, you wanna avoid using proprietary language and custom acronyms in the, in the technical documentation, uh, except where absolutely necessary. But the glossary is the space where you can provide those uh, explanations about what you mean by certain terms. So good API documentation has four pillars, or at least that's what I call it, the four pillars of good API documentation. The first pillar is informational. Good API documentation is informational. It explains the mechanisms and the how and why it works. Uh, this can be explaining the mechanisms or underlying systems and abilities, being transparent as much as you can about what's happening inside the box. Your API can be a black box to the user. And it is true that initially the user does not, may not care about what the API is actually doing in the underlying system. But the more open you are about what the system is doing, the more you can identify with the user uh, and the more the user feels in control of the message that they're sending to you or uh, the, the action or operation that you're, they're entrusting you with. Good API documentation is also educational. Uh, this can be teaching the user about the domain, its problems and its solutions. It's jargon specific, don't, uh, domain specific language, um, maybe how your API in particular approaches a situation. Um, identifying teachable moments and including them in the documentation is what this, this is meant to speak to. Obviously, uh, good API documentation is uh, technical. Uh, that means simply producing technically correct instructions. This is of paramount importance. Everything else is aspirational. You must get this thing correct. Um, and finally, good API documentation is all about being promotional. This includes linking and exposing opportunities. Um, so just think links, think web links, think connecting articles and documents and other information, maybe explaining usages and pricing options associated with uh, the API pointing to integrations and third-party libraries, SDKs, raising awareness about related communities and things like that. So again, good API documentation is more than usable, it's useful. Good API documentation is not simply technically correct instructions. If you take one thing from this talk, good API documentation is not simply technically correct instructions. So how do you know if you're doing it right? I think of the four pillars uh, and I created this quick check. I don't particularly reference this slide, but I, I, I created this slide so that you can think about these four pillars and how it applies to the API documentation you write or may write. Going down the list, uh, good API documentation informs, it's transparent about how it works and why it works, it educates, it explains domain-specific language, gives context and background information. It instructs, it's technically correct. It explains what to do and what to expect. And it promotes, uh, it exposes what's related and also what's possible beyond the obvious. I have some examples of good API documentation in the wild. I am just going to make reference to 
API providers that you can research on your own, but I, I won't get into their particular implementations for the sake of time, but I will sort of uh, describe each platform and what they do. Uh, and there'll be links. And if you need more information, you can ask me later in the Q and A. Uh, so first up is Stripe. Stripe provides a payment processing API. There's SendGrid. SendGrid provides an email delivery API. There's Linode. I work here currently. Uh, they provide an infrastructure automation API. GitHub. GitHub provides an API around their source code management system or version control system. Postmark. Postmark is another uh, email service provider. They provide an email delivery API. PayPal. Another payment processor, they provide a payment processing API. And finally, Braintree. Braintree was recently acquired by PayPal, and they also provide a payment processing API. Uh, and that concludes my presentation. Are there any questions, suggestions, comments, feedback? So I'm starting to see some, see some questions come through in the chat. Uh, Wendy Fish has asked, can you please Tell me more about the glossary. Is that the reference section? Yes, uh, it's similar to a glossary and uh, any technical documentation or literature. Um, it's where you explain uh, domain specific language. For example, let's say that you work in marketing and you refer to a particular system as a BMS, a brand management system. Um, for the person interacting with the API, they may not necessarily need to know or care that you refer to this one component as a BMS. So that would be where you would define what a BMS is. Thanks, Al. I see one raised hand from Anu R. If you'd like to... Uh... Unmute yourself and ask your question. We're happy to hear it. So uh, are there any examples of particularly bad documentation that uh, for me, it works more uh, better to uh, know what not to do? Oh, I see. Um, I have not collected um, examples of bad documentation. Um, I, I think that bad documentation in the context of this presentation are, um, is documentation that miss opportunities. There, there are lots of examples of bad documentation. Yeah, there are. Uh, and, and usually people, when people think bad documentation, they think documentation that is out of date, uh, technically inaccurate. Um, I, uh, Th those do qualify for, as bad documentation, but I, I also think of missed opportunity. I, I also think of documentation that has missed opportunities uh, as bad documentation as well. I want to I want to caveat that by saying you know a lot of the uh, other than uh, the technical pillar and the four pillars, everything else is aspirational. Um, so it, it is not the case that if you don't if, if you're not educating and if you're not promoting in your documentation, it's not the case that your documentation is therefore bad. Um, but if you have the ability to do those things and you are not, uh, I would say that your documentation is not as good as it could be. Mm -hmm. So with a lot of the APIs I've seen, it's been mainly that, okay, so your API is all well and good. How am I supposed to use it uh, in my own uh, application, you know? Zero bit, nothing about that. Yeah, yeah. I as a as an API professional, uh, I've um, I've had to shop for APIs to solve some domain problem that the company didn't want to take on themselves, and the API documentation that caused me to adopt a particular API was always the API documentation that said, "Hi, I know who you are." I understand what you need to do. Here's how you do it. And it sort of progressively exposed me to more of the API. It, it, it wasn't just sort of like a PDF of here are the technical instructions, you know, go figure it out. 
So. Um, I'll jump back to the chat and try to get one from there. Uh, we see Livy has asked, how do you test documentation with users? Well, uh, so, so there's, so documentation testing uh, is something that you should do if you can do it. Specifically testing API documentation with users, documentation is unlike, uh, is not, sorry, a doc, documentation is not unlike I'm sorry, let me, let me further qualify. Web-based documentation is not unlike a regular website. Uh, so you would test it using what the same methods that you would use when uh, testing uh, you know, uh, website usage and adoption. So you'll put trackers in your documentation and see which pages users are spending the most amount of time on, what links they are uh, navigating to and from, um, so that would that that's a way that you could test uh, um, uh, documentation um, usage. Sorry, that's one way that you could test documentation usage. A way that you would, but you should also consider testing uh, textual documentation for consistency. So that means like having the engineers writing tests that uh, make sure that. Uh, the links are sound, uh, that they will navigate somewhere, and that they won't die in 404. Um, that the terms, if, if you can, if you can get into that level of testing, that, the, that the, the terms are used consistently and certain terms that can be hyperlinked are uh, things like that. You should do that if you can, if you have the resources. To. Thanks, Al. Um, Jeff Reynolds, uh has a question, so we'll pass it to them. Hi, thanks folks. Uh, I was just wondering about kind of pushing beyond, you know, what Swagger might generate for you. It's, it's you know, really common to get really good reference documentation and be able to, um, you know, take the Lego box and, and try and make sense of all the methods and endpoints. But um, what I've been really spending a lot of time on is actually developing discrete persona. I, and I have four or six persona um, that I've been able to identify that uh, might touch on API documentation, um, just from the you know the, the business guys who are just interested in the value prop and the business rules and the tech stuff, all the way through to the guy who's sandboxing it to a, a stable deployment. And I was just wondering if uh, you spend any time developing kind of best practices documentation um, that might show somebody just the most common or the highest value things they can do with your with your API rather than just shipping, you know, the reference suite and, and if anyone else has actually gone that way either. So uh, yes, the, the answer to that is yes, I have done that. Um, it's, it's different for, um, I feel like I'm gonna answer a, a few questions, some that I've seen in chat and some that you've answered, Jeff. So um, uh, I have done that in the past, uh, particularly when I worked uh, uh, for a company called Vanguard. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit because uh, my one of my mandates was to create an API developer portal. Um, uh, I don't have a guide that uh, can be used irrespective of the organization or uh, industry. Um, and I think that's because everyone, there are no standards around creating this kind of robust documentation around APIs. Everyone uh, rolls their own solution and does it uh, very differently. Um, Leslie and I actually work together uh, and we've, they, she, she and her team have developed uh, a means for creating robust documentation around an API spec, which I actually can talk about. But I do want to answer your uh, particular question. So, so I have not seen very many companies do, do what you're suggesting, which is, and I don't want to repeat it just so I understand, just, just so I make sure I understand it correctly. So you want to create documentation that caters to particular types of users, personas. Um, I know a few, I can think of a few companies that I've been involved with that have wanted to do something like that, but um, 
but opted not to because doing that meant keeping track of four different types of documentation um, and having and having to align that with the API specification. Now, if you have an API specification, doing that is not that difficult, but I've I've worked with a lot of companies that were at various stages of having a specification. So I guess in short, if you don't have a specification, it makes doing something like that difficult. If you do have a specification, uh, uh, it makes some, doing something like that easier. And there are tools like Postman where that is a, uh, a core concept. So I, I'll, I'll say this and then I'll stop. Uh, and I wasn't going to talk about tooling, but Postman is an API client that also supports collaborative documentation. And one of the core concepts that differentiates Postman from uh, what Postman calls the collection from the open API specification, which has become sort of the industry standard, the, the differentiator is that Postman collections are not to be, are not meant to be the canonical source of truth. They are a persona specific view into an API. Uh, and, they, and that tool, Postman, encourages people to create lots of views into an API. So an API may do 50 things, but the collection that you share and document may only document the 10 things that a marketing person needs to do with the API. And so um, I understand what, you, what you're asking. Uh, I, I don't have a guy that I've applied to multiple organizations. I have done that very thing with a few particular organizations. Um, we do not do that thing at Leno where Leslie and I work. Uh, and I hope that answers your question, Jeff. All right, we have a couple more questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to jump to Stanley's question. Has it been your experience the more successful API writers are engineers with an interest in writing versus writers with some background in APIs? I cannot answer that question. I'm sorry. Uh, most of the uh, I, I don't know that I've worked closely enough with people that I know to be technical writers without any API experience. Um, so I don't know that I can answer that question. I'm sorry. Did You're I miss sure. the other question? Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe. I we don't can think so. It. Okay. I, I'm sure, you know, both have uh, benefits and, you know, drawbacks but everyone probably you know trains up to what they need to fill in so um and i'll just i'll just add something to that <clears throat> that's interesting that's an interesting question now now that i think about it because I've, I've been in many leadership positions where i've had to hire technical professionals but i've never had to hire technical writers they've always existed in the organizations where i've landed um, or they didn't exist at all. Uh, and so I've never been responsible for like evaluating them, getting to know their, their backgrounds. Um, so I kind of show up and technical writers are already there or completely absent. So I'm sorry, I, I, I can't answer that. No worries, Al. Um, in a similar vein, uh, and I guess this might be the last question given time, um, what's the best way to interact with the developers on your team to get out of the jargon-laden techno babble? This is coming from Leslie Hobbs. Okay. What is the best way to get out of uh, excessive use of jargon uh, by the teams that are writing the documentation, I suppose? Uh, could, could you just rephrase that again? I, I think I understand it, but I want to make sure, sure I, get I can it add. Yeah. I can add some more color to that. Yeah, please. Yeah. So one of your pillars was be really clear and succinct and don't use lots of jargon. And yet my team's experience that when they interact with the developers, they want to use lots of jargon and fall back on super technical terms that don't help 
when you talk about that casual person who's just coming in and they want a big overview of what the API does, and then later they should dig deeper into like that glossary to get right that jargon sort of stuff out of there. Absolutely. Yes. Oh, I understand completely. Uh, my view of it is that that is the job of the technical writers, um, but I'm more than happy to be corrected on this, but let me just explain. So I, I believe that the technical writers, part of their work is translating um, the technical capabilities into something that is more digestible. Um, in addition to the technical writing, um, they should have a mind, uh, you know, things I talked about in the four pillars, they should have a mind for where can, where are teachable moments in the documentation, um, uh, where are marketing opportunities within the documentation. And so the developers are, I, I expect the engineers to try to be very precise, which means using the jargon. Again, you know, they're gonna want to call the thing the BMS, the brand management system, you know, but you know that if you're writing a guide uh, and a person for a person that's entry level to your systems that you may not want to use BMS, maybe you might want to spell it out and say brand management system, or maybe you might just want to say content management system or management system. So, um, I, so again, uh, in short, I think that it's okay that the developers want to be use high jargon uh, and be you know, super precise. Uh, and I think that the technical writers, if it's okay with them, can just sort of act as translators and interpreters. I, I think that you had a really great suggestion there. I think that sometimes when we talk to developers, if we tell them, hey, we're trying to frame up a teachable moment, right? That gives them a little bit of chance to kind of back up and say, oh, if I were gonna teach someone about this, maybe I would frame it a little bit different and help the technical writer to get to the right level of what they're wanting to put in the documentation. But that's a great um, response. Thanks for that. Oh, no problem. Thank you for the question, it was a great question. Can I make a little add to that? Is that okay, sure. Al? Yeah. Uh, I've worked with a wide variety of developers with various levels of gatekeeping. Uh, I have found it to be somewhat effective to interact with them in a way that is similar to, uh, imagine I am about six and a little bit of a petulant child and you need to explain to me how this works. And I'm going to keep asking you why with no specifics until I find a satisfactory answer. Uh, that generally makes them laugh which then loosens the situation a little bit more and establishes some rapport and often gets me better, more specific answers uh, because I'm not six and I ask questions outside of why uh, after that point <laughs> in, the, in the conversation. Um, it's a tactic. Uh, there are many people who you could just go up and say, hey, I'm writing this for this audience and they'll go, great, awesome, let's do it. Um, um, everybody's different. Yeah, I, yeah. Thank you for that, and I agree with you. I would just say that, in my experience, not everyone is good at communicating highly technical topics uh, to um, people of varying technical backgrounds. You know, from novice uh, or, or or from uh, from sort of as knowledgeable about the domain on down to an office. Uh, so you have to consider that, you know, you may be, you may really want an engineer to be able to break down a problem, but that might not be uh, an ability that they have. It, it, you know, it's, it is a skill that you should uh, appreciate when you do find it in an engineer, the ability to communicate highly technical topics um, at varying degrees based on the person that they're talking to. So. Is it okay if I chime in? Um, sorry, I have a quickie question. I'm the writer type who migrated into technical writing. I think the hardest thing I do is HTML and CSS. Um, so I've been working um, for about three years and dealing with um, most recently with solutions architects 
who um, are creating solutions for level one and level two personnel use. So it gets it to be a little bit of a challenge with um, the jargon um, because they, they the solutions architects love it, level two, less so. Um, and I find that I try to bridge the gap by being visual in um, my documentation and trying to, which is not API documentation. I'm totally new to this. Um, I am taking a course online to try to learn it. And what I found that's a challenge for me is there not a lot of visual content so far that I've seen. Um, and I find, I know that I've gained from the, the, the level one and level two personnel, they like that visual content because they can pick up the info very, very quickly, much faster than via the text. And I'm wondering, you mentioned examples, um, and being as I'm a newbie, so this may be a very stupid question. Um, does that translate into any kind of visual information in your documentation? Because it doesn't seem like, from what I'm learning, that you guys, that the developers, are very visual at all. <laughs> They're just very, <laughs> they seem to be very code based, and that's um, it. And, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. There are no stupid questions. Um, and I would say that the, the visual versus uh, technical um, scale, for lack of a better expression, is, is based on your audience. You just have to know who your audience is. When I'm talking to executives uh, and uh, upper management, uh, they want to see diagrams and they want to see flow charts and um, Gantt charts for communicating timelines and things like that. Uh, so for that audience, <laughs> For that audience, those visual aids are very helpful. Um, if I showed your average engineer flow charts and Gantt charts, unless it was accompanied by the necessary technical like specifications, mm -hmm. they wouldn't care. And in fact, they might be incensed by the lack of technical detail. So you just have to know yeah. your, your audience. You know, APIs are no different. The consumers of the API, the people shopping for your API platform, they're going to be, um, oh, actually, so that's a good segue into the types of people shopping for APIs. So uh, you, they're usually technical of some caliber. Uh, sometimes they can be business analysts. They're just sort of looking for your documentation to have the requisite buzzwords so that they can so that they can recommend it to their superiors or stakeholders um, and then that usually is followed by someone with a, a more pointed technical background to evaluate your api documentation to see if it actually can solve the problem in a way that's familiar to the people that are evaluating it. Um, and so if you can, uh, and so visual aids of the kind that you're talking about could be of service to those business analyst types that are looking at the documentation, but I, I hesitate to call that documentation. That I, I would say that that's marketing material that connects to your documentation. You know, yeah. so there's a line there somewhere. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right, with that, um, I think that um, we might want to start the breakout rooms, Alyssa. Okay. Even time. Well, let's, uh, let's start by saying thank you 100% to Al for a really excellent presentation. Um, I just felt like this community would really love that presentation, and I think they did. So thank you so much. And thank you to mm -hmm. Leslie for being willing to MC. And thank you to all the other local organizers who helped run tonight's call.